Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Looks like the towers are up and everything's going right this morning, so we can actually have our guest on the Facebook Live as well as the ones here this morning, which is good because I like to think some of them was disappointed they didn't get to see it last week, but <laughs> hopefully it's because they didn't get God's Word and not because they missed me. If we will, let's take our uh, Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 26 is where we're going to get started. And y'all know me, we're going to chase a few scriptures around. We're going to try to make it all make it all come together so that we can see what God's Word has to say for us as we seek to do His will. We all know for a fact that Jesus Christ lived His life here on earth not only as a sacrifice, but also as an example to us of how we're supposed to live and act and things that we are supposed to be able to we're supposed to be able to uh, look at his life in the way that he does so that, you know, that what would Jesus do? And I used to joke with some of them that were trying to make me all docile or whatever, say, what would Jesus do? You know, that flipping tables and whipping behinds is not above the realm of possibilities, you know, because he did that. He says, be angry yet sin not. So being angry within itself is not a sin. So if anybody tries to tell you that you're sinning because you got angry, what you do after you get angry is where the sin's going to come in. So that's what we got to watch and check up on. And I don't know why I chased that rabbit trail because that's not exactly where we were headed with this. But in, in, in Matthew 26, starting at verse 36, it says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and saith unto, unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. And I was thinking, you know, when things are going on with, with fellow Christians, even this Christ, do we watch with them? Do we sit with them whenever they're sorrowful, whenever they're hurting? Do we take that little bit of time to spend with them? Verse 39 says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now this was the cup of crucifixion. This was making salvation complete. So for those of any of you that ever give credence to anybody that claims there's another way to heaven other than through Jesus Christ, you look at this verse right here. If there's any other way, Jesus would not have gone to the cross. If there was any other way to make salvation other than through Jesus Christ, he would not have went there. There's no reason he would have went there. That would be stupid, and our Savior's not stupid. Our God, Heavenly Father's not stupid. He made the only way, the only perfect full sacrifice that could be. So if anybody starts throwing anything other than Jesus Christ in there for salvation, they're wasting your time and theirs, and they're just trying to mess with your head. Okay, They're trying to rob you of the truth of your salvation in Jesus. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? And I was thinking, how many, how many of our Christian brothers and sisters are sound asleep right now? They don't spend an hour a day in prayer, in the Bible, in any other way seeking God and seeking his will. But they're out there yelling and screaming that they know what a Christian should be like. And they're pointing their finger at me telling me that I'm not very Christian-like because I said something that hurt somebody's feelings even though it came straight out of the word of God. If it's a sin, it's a sin. If it hurts your feelings, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter if I'm doing it or you're doing it. or You know, when David done it, it was a sin. Even though he was a man after God's own heart. Said. So you know, just because we disagree with somebody and we're telling them the truth, if they disagree with God, it doesn't mean that we hate them. It means that we love them enough to tell them the truth. See, that's how everything's got flipped on its head. You go into the trouble of telling folks, well, you must hate me because you don't agree with me. I love you enough to tell you that you're being stupid. I've had people tell me enough to tell me I'm being stupid. Don't do it in that manner because then you're hurting my feelings and I'm going to sew up and I'm not going to listen to you. 
There's ways of telling people without being ugly. That's the part that we don't get our mind around sometimes. We have to bring it without. Because sometimes I know what the problem is. Because you look at somebody and you love them so much and it enrages you. Because you know better than to do that. You're smarter than that. You're my brother or sister in Christ. You knew better. What are you doing? That's the matter with you. And we're so incensed by that because they, they should know better. And we expect better of them. And now we're looking like as bad as them because we sinned in, in our anger. We didn't do it right. What's Jesus say? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh, and ain't that where the rubber meets the road for me? Spirit's willing, but the flesh, oh my goodness, the flesh, it's acting up. You know why they talk about the definition of stress? Is whenever the spirit and the mind overrides the body's urge to grab somebody and choke them half to death because they desperately deserve it. And then we think about the mercy and grace that Christ give us and we're kind of like, well, you know, if he didn't just snuff me out for being what I've been or doing what I've done, why can't I bear with this person for just a little bit and show them the love of Christ by not strangulating them? You know, that, that helps. He went away again a second time and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, Thy will be done. Again, salvation being made complete through the death, burial, and crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. There's no other way for salvation other than the provision made by God through Jesus Christ, his only son, God in flesh. Anybody that comes preaching any other Jesus, a created being, there's some out there with that trying to tell you that Jesus is a created being, that he's the brother of Lucifer, some garbage like that. Well, as soon as they do that, understand that they're teaching you a lie. And, it, you know, there may be some 20% truth mingled in it, maybe 80% truth mingled in it. What if it's 99% truth mingled in it? How much poison is in rat poison and the rest is nutritious food? Maybe 1% and that's all it takes to kill you? What's it take to sicken and kill your soul? What does it take to condemn you to hell? If you're following most of the truth, but you miss that one thing of putting your faith and trust in Christ, hell is hot and real and forever. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Our churches are asleep. I think some of them are beginning to rub the sand out of their eyes and wake up a little bit. Most of them have been lulled fast asleep, though, since about, what, the 60s? I tell you. Why don't you save that preaching for Sunday? My life is going to preach my Savior, Jesus Christ. I will preach from my desk. I will preach from the other side of the retail store, wherever I'm shopping. My life is going to try to be Christ-like. It's going to try to show joy and salvation that others don't have. Why are you miserable? Because you know your destination's hell. You may deny it. But if you haven't got Christ as your Savior, you know your destination's hell. You're miserable because you've got nothing to look forward to. And you don't want anybody reminding you. That's why you say, take that preaching out of here. I don't want to hear it. That's why if they see me or you or somebody that's really got the joy of Jesus, you're smiling, your eyes are shining bright, they hate you immediately. Why? They don't hate you. They hate you're happy because they don't have it. They don't want to go to the trouble of getting their own, which isn't really any trouble. If they want to stomp yours out, they would rather spend half their life trying to stomp the joy out of you than to just reach out and grab Christ. And again, he left them and went away again and prayed the, the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. There comes a time. Whenever we feel the urging of the Holy Spirit to do something, the time's passed and there's nothing else we can do but ride it out.
and he'll give us another opportunity. I mean, this, this was actually a unique opportunity. But he'll give us opportunity to speak his truth into someone's life, to speak his love into someone's life. And sometimes somebody else or something will try to lull us to sleep to where we can't say anything. We don't want to say anything. We're scared. We might offend them because everybody's offensively offended about something these days. Well, if you're offended because I love you enough to tell you that I want you to go to heaven with me, I want you to be there praising God. There's going to be so many things we can't even think about. Your, your, work, your best day here is nothing to compare to our worst day there. And folks just don't get that. They don't want to get it. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Who betrays Jesus? I was thinking about that when I was reading that last night. Have you ever betrayed Jesus? We've all betrayed Jesus. We've all been asleep. We've all sat back and not give him one hour. There's been times I didn't give him an hour a week, much less a day. How sorry a condition did my life get in whenever I was doing that? How low did I get and how miserable was I? And if we think about that, we know why everybody else is miserable that don't have Jesus or those that, well, I don't want to go back to that church because, or any church because there's people there that think they're better than me. How do you know what they think? And what do you care what they think? Are you there to worship them? Are you there to worship God? Are you seeking God? Are you seeking somebody to make you feel good? And we're going to get into that a little bit too. Of uplifting each other. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 15. Starting at verse 1. Romans 15, starting at verse 1. We, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Okay? We're supposed to help each other up if we're feeling a little strong that day. And not to please ourselves. Now what's that telling us? We're supposed to help people because it's the right thing to do. Not because, I mean, you think about all these foundations of these rich atheists or agnostics or whatever, what are they doing? They're trying to make themselves feel good because they feel great that they help somebody up. It feels good to help somebody up, but don't do it for that reason. Do it for the reason of God said to. And especially those within our church, lift them up. And if we lift them up, we'll notice that we're standing a little straighter too. And don't do it with pride. And don't announce it. I've told some, don't be telling people what I do. And steal my, steal my blessings because I don't want my blessings to be the praise of man. If I help somebody, I don't. I really prefer nobody knows it. Sometimes even the person that was helped, just bring them up and know that somebody loves you enough. God sent somebody to bring you up to encourage you. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. You ever had anybody tell you why are you talking to them? You know what a low-life person they are? Well, i tell you why I'm talking to them, because they need Jesus. They're a person. They have a soul. And I'd really prefer them to be in heaven than hell. And if they are any of what anybody's saying they are, they need Jesus more, not more. We all need him. They need Jesus just as bad as we do. And that's going to make a better person out of them. Then you can quit running your mouth about me and them. You know? For whosoever, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Have you got hope? If you don't have hope, I'm thinking you need to check up and see if you have Jesus. Because that hope comes through Jesus. That's where our hope is. There's no hope other than through him. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Be like-minded one toward another. Does, that does not say that we have to agree about everything. But like-minded one towards another means 
Brother Gene, I love you. Don't care how wrong you are. You know, you may have looked at that scripture and you got it flipped upside down or maybe I got it flipped upside down. But like-minded, I want to see you go to heaven and I want us to influence for folks for, for God. And I'm not going to have a big dog fight as long as you tell me that you put your faith, trust, and hope firmly in Christ for salvation. That's the biggest fight we're going to have. You know, Other, you know, if, if, if you tell me that, that, we're good. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. That's what are, what are we supposed to do here? Glorify God. And if we're glorifying God and sharing his love, people are going to want to have more of it. Even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision and the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So he didn't come to do away with the law. He confirmed the law. The law was a schoolmaster to teach us that man is inherently evil. Our minds always, and we can't do it ourselves. We can't save ourselves. Nothing we can do about it. We had to focus on him and work day by day to be more like him and to put our faith firmly in him, trusting in him. And all these Jews, and there's no replacement by the church. Let's look at this. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Rejoice with his people. It doesn't say rejoice ye replacing his people. Rejoice with his people. Again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And I was looking at that. Praise the Lord and laud him, all ye people. Laud, and I got to looking at that. Like, why would they put praise and laud? Because laud just basically means praise. And I kept looking at it and studying it. And, and laud means applaud and praise. So it's, it's just a little bit higher praise. You know, praise, praise him good. Clap your hands. Be happy, you know. When was the last time you heard somebody read a Bible verse and everybody like, yeah, that's great. That's great. More and more like dozing down. Are you seeking God's word or you're dozing off and you're going to take that hour of sleep when you're supposed to be the hour of prayer? Sweet hour of sleep, no, sweet hour of prayer. That's what it says. That's what we were singing a while ago, wasn't it? Verse 12 says, and again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jess and he that shall rise and reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Who's that? Jesus Christ. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now did you get all of that? We're going to abound in hope in the, through the power of the Holy Ghost. How are you going to have the Holy Ghost? It's going to be by calling on him to save you. <laughs> Believe on him and call on him and confess him with your mouth. And you can have joy and peace. Joy and peace in believing, believing on Jesus, then abound in hope and power of the Holy Ghost. That's sweet stuff right there to me. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to also admonish one another. Now, that's something other that many churches is missing. But they're not going to admonish one another. What's admonish? That means gently correct, lovingly direct. It's kind of like, woo, you might, you know, I, I've done it to, to preachers. I've done it to deacons. I've done it with... You know, it's kind of like, um, brother, did you, let's check up on this that you just went over. Let's let's do a study and make sure that we write on this because one of us has got a little bit off. Let's study it a little bit. Now, and on the flip side of that, I could have went up there and said, hey, you blew that. You think they would have heard anything I said? <laughs> no, that's not admonishing. That's scolding. And that's where folks make huge problems. They go in there going to straighten somebody out rather than having that idea of there's a little possibility that I could be wrong. As awesome and wonderful and smart as I am, let's look at it and see why did you think that and say maybe I missed something because this word is so deep. 
this spirit is so full, I might have missed something. It might not have been speaking to me the way that it should have, and I might have it wrong. Look at it openly with the Holy Spirit going with you before you go to somebody and say, look at him, brother, you wrong. Because it might not be. But then again, it just might be. Let's look at James chapter 5 for a minute. We'll wrap this up. James chapter 5, starting at uh, verse 7. It seemed like God was all over me this morning. Be patient, therefore, brethren. Anybody know me? Well, I'm a patient person. I really am. You ever want to see me almost go into convulsions, tell me no, there's nothing can be done. Sorry, nothing can be done. I don't care if it's at the hospital or at the DMV or whatever. Don't I don't believe there's nothing can be done. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to step back and pray over it for a minute because the natural man is wanting to show out as soon as you tell me nothing can be done. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receiveth the early and the latter rain. Now, y'all heard about the guy that was going into corn farming, didn't you? It's kind of like a lot of Christians are. He's out there, you know, he was out there at daylight. He was excited. He was out there plowing and planting and working on it. And he came in about 1.30, and uh, he was throwing his boots, he was throwing his hat, and he was just having a fit. And that's why I said, what's the matter, honey? He said, I'm, I'm done. I quit. I've had it. He said, what do you mean you've had it? He said, I've been out there planting all day, and there ain't one thing up. There's not one ear corn. You know what? As Christians, we're just as dumb as that sometimes. I've been handing out tracts. I've been living right for God. My life's a shambles. Everything's, I'm losing everything. Nobody believes me. Nothing's happening. I'm quitting. We just like it, you know. How long does it take for the fruit to grow? How long does it take for something to happen whenever we plant in those seeds of joy and peace and love? Do we expect immediate results? It's kind of like, well, I went in and was nice, and they were just still so sour and ornery. <laughs> My feelings just hurt. I know the feeling because it's kind of like, you know, well, we'll either give them peace and joy or a slap down, whichever they, they can choose. You know, they can see either side of me I want. Be also patient. Establish your heart. Oh, establish your heart. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You know what? It's always a little closer every day, every minute, every hour. Oh, boy. Here's, here's problems we have. Grudge not one against another. But you don't know what they said. You don't know what they did. Don't matter. They probably didn't mean it as harsh as it sounded anyway. They might not even know they done it. Brethren, lest ye be condemned. So what is it? Holding a grudge grows a root of bitterness in your soul and eats you up, makes you bitter and hateful. It doesn't really hurt the person that you're grudging against. The judge standeth before the door. Who's going to judge us for the thoughts that we had and how many grudges we held? It's going to be, that's going to be Jesus standing right there at the, at, the, at the judgment seat. And he's going to say, you want to explain this? And then, I have nothing. I have nothing. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, of patience. And think about the different prophets that preached and preached and preached. And the people mocked and mocked and mocked and mocked. And they could, you know, different times you've seen different ones that directly linked to God. God telling them just what to tell the people. They get thrown in prison. They get thrown in dungeon holes. Get torn in two. And you think, boy, I've got it hard. Somebody tore up a track right in front of my face. And called me an idiot. Oh, boy. 
Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender in mercy. I don't mean the Lord's pathetic. That means he's full of pity for you. In case anybody got that twisted, I'm sure everybody knew what, what it was, but he's full of pity for you and me because we're pathetic when we really look at it. No matter how wonderful and great we think we are, we're fairly pathetic, and he's full of tender mercy to fill us with the Holy Spirit and bring us where we need to be. But above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. You ever fell into condemnation because you swore you was going to do something? My memory, my forgetter works better than my rememberer. And I got to be careful if I promise somebody that I'll do something or I'll get something out for them in a certain amount of time. If I do, I better do it right then because I can write it down over here and I'll never see it again until about a week later. And it's like, <gasps> or when they're calling back going, did you get, mm, did, I, I don't know. Sometimes I'm having trouble even remembering the conversation. Why is that? Is that because I've got so much going on? Is that because I'm allowing myself to be overloaded? Is it because of stress? Is it because I let things get to me? Is it because I'm not giving it to Christ? Is it because I'm not as old as John, but I'm getting a little older? <laughs> Here, when you get over 50, your member starts out running your forgetter. No, your forgetter starts out running your member. See? You need, and, and you get things flipped around. So don't hold it against me if I say if I misspeak a little bit. You can trust and believe I trust wholly in Christ, not in me. If any of you is afflicted, let him pray. Is any married, let him sing songs. There's advice for everything that we want to do. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have any commit have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Who's righteous? We're none really. But what he's talking about is those who really have that tender heart, who's really praying to God, asking. Our hope, our joy, all in Christ. As long as we have ourselves asleep, you know, we're singing a lullaby, the whole world is. The church needs to go to sleep. Just lull them off. Keep them too busy to reach out. Make sure that their jobs are too, too full. Keep them gaining just enough that they think in a little while I'll have time. In a little while, I have time to live for God. In a little while, I have time 